Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the governor gives what is likely to be her last state of the state address. We will hear the speech in its entirety and then follow up with analysis on what the governor had to say. The state of the state next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Governor Jan Brewer today outlined her agenda for the upcoming legislative session in the governor's annual State of the State Address. We'll have response and analysis to the speech, but first, here is the governor's State of the State Address. Speaker Tobin, President Biggs, Honorable Senators and Representatives of the Arizona Legislature, Chief Justice Birch and the Supreme Justices of the Court, and Constitutional Officers, Tribal Leaders, Honored Guests, and my fellow Arizonans. It's my pleasure to welcome back Representative Doris Goodale. You've gone through a long struggle. You've gone through a long struggle, Doris, and we're all gratified to, to see you here today, ready to build us a better Arizona. And while I'm pleased by Doris's recovery, I was terribly saddened to lose Ben Miranda. Catherine, the state of Arizona extends our deepest sympathies for your loss and the loss of a great public servant, your husband and my friend Ben. His voice will be missed, but let us pray that his spirit of public service lives on in all of us. When I stood here for the first time as governor, we faced the daunting task of navigating the state I love out of the bleakest recession in our history and back onto the path of prosperity and opportunity. I recognized that overcoming this challenge would be difficult and painful. It would require honest leadership and tough decision making. And then, of course, there are challenges we can never predict, challenges that test our resolve. This past year, Arizona experienced one of the worst tragedies in our history as we lost 19 heroic firefighters at Yarnell Hill. That June day will forever be etched into our hearts. The brave 19 and their families forever in our prayers. Please stand and join me in a moment of silence to honor these fallen firefighters. Thank you. Today, I am proud of the progress we've made in the past five years to bring about the Arizona comeback. We steered Arizona out of a debilitating recession and implemented historic reforms and long-term structural improvements that secure Arizona's prosperity for generations to come. It's been a challenge, one I could not have fully managed without the constant support and guidance from my family. I am so very grateful for them for always being there for me. Thanks to my husband, John, my son, Michael, who once again joined me in this chamber. I also appreciate the support from the people of Arizona, lawmakers, the business community, and countless others. Together, we have worked hard 
to guide Arizona out of the historic recession we inherited. As my hero, Ronald Reagan said during his 1967 inaugural as governor of California, and I quote, we will put our fiscal house in order, and as we do, we will build those things we need to make our state a better place in which to live, and we will enjoy them more, knowing we can afford them, and they are paid for, end of quote. I'm proud to report to you today that Arizona's fiscal house is in order, and together, let's keep it that way. We've come a long way in a short time. In 2009, Arizona's budget was irresponsibly drained after years of unsustainable spending. We had the worst budget deficit of any state. Today, we've reined in government spending by consolidating, eliminating, and transforming our operations. In 2009, Arizona had a $3 billion deficit. Today, Arizona boasts a healthy state surplus and a replenished rainy day fund. Most impressively, we ended this past fiscal year with nearly $900 million in the bank. There is no doubt Arizona is back on track. We also remember that our state was swept up in some of the worst unemployment in our history. And Arizona's businesses and families struggled to stay afloat. Today, we've turned things around. With help from the Arizona Commerce Authority, our historic tax reforms, our employers have created nearly 175,000 new jobs with an impressive $4.3 billion in new capital investment. In 2009, Arizona was ranked among the worst states in an antiquated business stifling tax policy. Today, we're among the best for attracting and helping our business grow and thrive. We lowered business property and equipment taxes. We lowered corporate income taxes. And we lowered capital gain taxes. We even simplified sales taxes from a confusing, multi-city, multi-layered process to a single collection and audit. Don't let anyone fool you. The tax and regulatory environment in our state matters. Businesses across the nation and the world are watching. Our message to job creators has been heard. Arizona is open for business. We now have more jobs, more businesses, and more opportunities for growth and prosperity. And I'm in good company believing that. Arizona is ranked in the top 10 by CEOs nationwide. And Forbes magazine recognized us as the number one state for expected job growth. It's no surprise we have attracted and expanded major companies like Apple, GM, Intel, State Farm, and many, many more. And I'm confident more are on the way. Our focus on job creation continues to pay off. That's because we listened to what businesses need and what attracts more of them to Arizona. We address the issues around uncompensated care and the hidden health care tax by, again, listening to the business community and honoring the will of the people. When the federal government shut down, we worked hard to reopen the Grand Canyon during a crucial time for our tourism industry. In doing so, we recovered more than $1 million in revenue per day, benefiting our communities, businesses, and the economy. We stood united in saying to Washington, do your job, keep the Grand Canyon open. <laughs> government, <laughs> government, 
Government should never close that which God has created. Arizona's ability to deal with our own issues stands in sharp contrast to the federal government's inability to deal with their core responsibilities, like securing the border, fixing immigration, and riding our national fiscal ship. On behalf of the people of Arizona, I say to the President and Congress, quit fighting and get to work for the American people. Unfortunately, we can't fix Washington from here, but we can and will continue to show the nation how it's done. Our hard work makes it all the more rewarding to stand here today and confidently proclaim that the spirit of Arizona is strong, and so is the state of our state. Well, some pundits and naysayers may try to brush aside such groundbreaking changes. We've continued to lead with practical and principled initiatives that drive Arizona forward. We must keep Arizona competitive in our tax structure, our education system, and our limited government, all of which are essential to a thriving economy. Certainly, improving Arizona's business climate has been a hallmark of these past five years. And as thrilled as I am with everything we've accomplished on behalf of Arizona's businesses, I am equally proud of the work we've done on behalf of Arizona's families. From school choice policies that give parents the power to decide their children's education, to life-affirming legislation protecting the unborn. Together, we have pursued and protected the values most important to Arizona's family and Arizona's future. The historic initiatives we have enacted these past few years have been transformational. We are not done, and we will remain unrelenting. Let's continue to face our challenges head on. Now is not the time to rest on our accomplishments. Our immediate challenge is to transform our child protection system to ensure the safety and well-being of Arizona's abused and neglected children. I know this. All of us care. And Arizona must do better. We created the Office of Child Welfare, Welfare Investigations as an instrumental first step. Thanks to OCWI, we discovered the horrifying truth that some at CPS failed to investigate or even respond to thousands of reports of child abuse. This is unconscionable. I have created the independent care team to oversee the investigation of these cases and to identify areas of concern within CPS. I also ordered the Department of Public Safety to conduct an administrative review to determine why these cases were not investigated. I want to report that the care team is making tremendous strides. To date, nearly all of the cases have been assigned and more than 3,000 children have been seen by CPS staff or local law enforcement. I also want to express my appreciation to Charles Flanagan, the entire care team, and the CPS staff working with them for their dedicated efforts getting eyes on these children. But our job is far from over. It is evident that our child welfare system is broken, impeded by years of structural and operational failures. It breaks my heart and makes me angry. Enough with uninvestigated reports of abuse and neglect. Enough 
with the lack of transparency. And enough with the excuses. This morning, I signed an executive order that abolishes CPS as we know it and establishes, and establishes a new division of child safety and family services with its own cabinet level director who reports to me. And I have asked Charles Flanagan to serve as that director. However, we need to go even further. The time has come to statutorily establish a separate agency that focuses exclusively on the safety and well-being of children and helping families in distress without jeopardizing child safety. I call on the legislature to work with me to codify a new permanent agency. Child safety must be the priority and become embedded in the fabric of this new agency. It is our, thank you, yes. It is our legal and moral duty. Another challenge that has confronted us far too long and has been a cornerstone of my career is behavioral health. For more than three decades, Arizona has been forced to live under court direction because we failed our seriously mentally ill population. As governor, I insisted that we properly fund and fundamentally reform behavioral health into a holistic, community-based system. I'm pleased that over the past two years with good faith negotiations in the Arnold v. Sarn litigation, this goal was accomplished. This win-win solution allows the seriously mentally ill to participate in society in a more meaningful way and to receive the service and the care they require and deserve. We also introduce metrics to evaluate the system and hold it accountable. As a result of these historic reforms, I was proud to announce last week an agreement subject to final court approval that will end the Arnold v. Sarn litigation after reaffirming Arizona's commitment to a community-based behavioral health care system. Now, let me be clear. While this watershed agreement ends more than 30 years of litigation, it is structured so if a future governor or legislature fails to live up to its terms, plaintiffs will be able to reopen the case. This should never happen. Arizona's system is working, and it is now a national model. <laughs> this agreement is the result of the hard work and dedication of many devoted people. Let me recognize one instrumental leader who showed unmatched passion and commitment to improving the lives of people with mental illness. Charles Arnold was the original lead plaintiff in the lawsuit that bears his name is with us today. Charles, would you please stand so that we can thank you for your perseverance on behalf of those who often cannot speak for themselves. Thank you. working to create a model for states dealing with another difficult challenge. Human trafficking traumatizes 27 million victims worldwide and targets women and children, turning many into sex slaves. It may shock you to know that it happens right here in Arizona. 
Let me tell you a story about one inspiring woman who triumphed over this modern day slavery. At age 16, Savannah Sanders was forced into the commercial sex industry and battled childhood rape, homelessness, and drug addiction. Thankfully, she is a survivor and a hopeful example, a loving wife and a proud mother pursuing her master's in social work at ASU. She advocates for victims traveling the country to promote awareness and prevention and providing comfort and healing for fellow survivors. Savannah shows us that there is hope and that we can stop this abuse and that we are stronger than this evil. This amazing woman is with us today. I'm proud of you, Savannah. Please stand and accept our gratitude for your inspirational human spirit. Last year, I established a human trafficking task force to address this problem, co-chaired by Cindy McCain and Gil Arantia. The task force recommended ways to better protect victims, to increase penalties for perpetrators, and to end these horrible crimes. Today, I ask you to strengthen Arizona's law to give prosecutors and law enforcement more tools to combat this evil and help better protect victims. We also will launch an awareness campaign so Arizonans will know what to look for and how to report it. And victims will know how to seek help. Further, I will create a human trafficking council to coordinate efforts statewide to address this crime. To all the victims of human trafficking out there, we have not forgotten you. Don't give up. Help is on the way. To the criminal traffickers, I say, your days are numbered. I firmly believe in this great state of Arizona in our ability to address our challenges and to be successful in pursuing tomorrow's potential. What we are doing today will set the tone for Arizona's economy and job creation for years. Our future quality of life depends on today's decisions. This year, I'm calling on the legislature to approve a package to further boost Arizona's business competitiveness, particularly and technology and manufacturing sectors, which brings high paying jobs. Arizona, for example, is one of the few states that imposes sales tax on manufacturers for the power used to create their products. That puts our current manufacturers and the ones we hope to recruit at a disadvantage. I'm asking you to send me legislation to eliminate this tax and increase Arizona's competitive edge. We recognize that manufacturing is more than just an industry. It's a mighty engine of healthy job creation. Arizona can be even more competitive. Let me give you an example. Recently, I toured the cell gene plant in West Phoenix which makes a drug that treats several forms of cancer. This breakthrough, life-saving drug is produced only in Arizona. And it was developed in Arizona. Thanks to a partnership with TGen, Scottsdale Healthcare, and others. It is this type of innovative, research-driven, and idea-to-market manufacturing system that ultimately produces good jobs and a healthy economy. 
To that end, it is imperative to have a stable, dedicated funding source for TGEN to continue its valuable role as a catalyst in developing Arizona's bioscience industry. Let's help Arizona develop more pipelines of innovation, connecting quality research, a stellar workforce, and a competitive manufacturing from beginning to end. For Arizona to remain competitive on all fronts, we also cannot ignore transportation, water, and other infrastructure demands. These are all paramount to creating jobs, attracting capital investment, and ensuring a sustainable future. Together, we must be honest and have an open dialogue about workable solutions to address these critical needs. Of course, none of our progress towards economic prosperity will ultimately work if we do not improve our K-12 schools. By 2018, three out of five jobs in Arizona will require post-secondary training. Our students must be better prepared for the challenging and competitive world they will soon enter. That means we stop funding the status quo and instead reward innovation and measured outcomes and fund the results we want. I am asking legislators to approve an ambitious and historic education proposal, which I call Student Success Funding. Under this plan, we will reward improved student performance and we will incentivize and replicate success. Also, reforms are needed in higher education. For example, Arizona's families working hard to save enough for their kids to seek a university degree are flat out tired of unpredictable tuition hikes. Arizona students and families need stability and affordability in their college education. To ensure that these twin goals are met, I am asking our Arizona Board of Regents to develop a plan and adopt a policy that guarantees stable in-state tuition levels for the four years it should take a student to graduate. <laughs> Together, we should be able to make this happen. Students expect it, and Arizona's tax-paying parents deserve it. Few things have a greater positive economic impact in Arizona's communities than our military bases. Together they contribute more than $9 billion to our economy annually while safeguarding our great country. We are more prepared to help the military accomplish its diverse missions than nearly any other state. I remain committed to protecting and enhancing Arizona's military bases. That is why I will direct the Military Affairs Commission to develop a strategic plan for sustaining their mission. We must be ready to protect Arizona's military installations if the federal government moves to close or realign more bases. <laughs> this year, I am calling on the legislature to renew support for the Military Installation Fund. That money will be used specifically to mitigate property encroachment and preserve military land use projects without throwing that financial burden on private property owners. Protecting our military is good for Arizona and good for America. I've been returning to the Capitol now for more than 30 years, uniting with my fellow public servants 
in pursuit of a shared mission. To stand up for the people we are entrusted to serve. To keep our honor clean and to leave this place better and freer than we found it. For a little more than a century, representatives of the people have come to this capital to lift it toward its prosperous destiny, to bring great fruit from this beautiful desert land, to hold our citizens safe from harm, and to provide children the knowledge, industry, and character that will make and keep them free. Great men and great women have walked these chambers and graced these lands with their honorable public service. We should aspire here to rank among the best of those. For this state was built by others before us and eventually will be left to others who will follow. It is ours to love only for a time. May we love it wisely and lead it well. Ten years from now, whether I run again or not, <laughs> I will be working in my garden and I will look back with pride. And if I can borrow a sentiment from Ronald Reagan, I will be uplifted knowing we weren't just marking time. We made a difference. We made this great state stronger. We made it freer. And we left her in good hands. May God bless us in that work and may God forever bless and protect the great state of Arizona and the United States of America. Thank you. After the governor gives the State of the State address, it is customary for the opposing party to offer a response. Here's what Democratic leaders had to say about the governor's speech. We must keep moving forward to protect our most vulnerable citizens, which are our children. CPS is in turmoil and its failures must be corrected without excuses and without delay. We can't let another child fall through the cracks. The governor today suggested a step forward from this solution. We look forward to learning more about the idea and working with her to ensure proper resources, transparency, accountability, and leadership as part of any plan. I think that there's still some some questions, though, about the, the great comeback, as the governor calls it. And I think if you look at the data, I, I think that that's simply not true. Are we recovering? Yes. Uh, we've, we've kind of stopped the bleeding, but have we actually recovered from the injury? I don't think so. If you look at our jobs, uh, we're nowhere near where we were pre-recession levels. Um, you look at our education system, you look at all the state agencies, whatever it may be, I'm not convinced that we're in such a solid position that Governor Brewer likes to project. Uh, are we better off in many ways than we were five years ago? Yes, but I don't think we're in the best position possible. And, and quite frankly, it's easy to claim a balanced budget and a $900 million surplus when you haven't funded education for five years. That's very simple to do. I use the analogy all the time. If you're sitting at home and you have a bank account that has $10,000 in it, but your roof's leaking, your car has four flat tires, and your kids have no clothes, should you be proud of that $10,000 sitting in your bank account? No, you shouldn't be. Your life is literally falling apart around you. We have an educational system that is not attaining the levels of achievement we need for our students. We have state agencies across the board, as we know, that are failing and leading to potentially life-threatening situations and in some cases probably have cost lives. We have a tax system that's still uncompetitive, even though we did some stuff on it last that got us there. But we have a long ways to go. Our unemployment rate is still very high, especially in rural Arizona. Go out to Yuma and ask them what they think about the great Arizona comeback in terms of jobs. I bet they have a very different answer than people in Phoenix. So was it a good state of the state? You know, there's some good things in it. 
But we have a long ways to go, and, and we need to have serious conversations down here this year about actually doing the right thing for the state, putting money where it needs to be, investing in the proper things to get Arizona back on track and moving forward, not to stop the bleeding, but actually moving forward now. Joining us now for analysis on the governor's state of the state address is political consultant Stan Barnes of Copper State Consulting and David Shapira, assistant superintendent of the East Valley Institute of Technology, or EBIT as we call it here. Mm -hmm. Good to see you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's start with the governor's, let's just start, let's start shallow and go deep, okay? <laughs> the governor's performance, seemed more confident up there, seemed uh, a little bit of a swagger at times. What did you think? Yeah, I, I, I shared the same opinion you have. You know, this is her fifth speech up there, right? I mean, something like, I haven't done the count, but she knows who she is. She's confident. She's been the governor now through the toughest times I've seen in my lifetime as a native Arizonan. And, and, and yet we're up and we're on a plane and we're going and she knows why she's in that chamber and she's very comfortable. And, it, and if it was her last, it was well done. If, it's, uh, if that indeed was her last uh, state of the state address, did she wrap up her administration in a nice tidy bow or was that that little uh, wink and a nod there at the end saying something? Well, I, you know, I mean, I think that was her goal. I think her goal was to wrap it up. And, and frankly, that's the first time I've seen her address the whether or not she can run re-election thing as a tongue-in-cheek moment where everyone laughed and she even gave a little smirk. So I think she sees it as her last. I think she accepted that she can't run for re-election. And I think her goal was, in, in what I think was a well-written speech, she has her same verbal, verbal hiccups as always, but a well-written speech, she did try to kind of tie it all together and wrap it up, but I think a lot of times the lofty rhetoric didn't necessarily match exactly what we've seen over the last five years. And, but I do think she set some ambitious goals for the next year, and, and hopefully, as always, hopefully we can meet some of those goals. Yeah, I think it's important for your viewers to know that uh, sometimes it feels very partisan in the room when the governor's making, no matter what party the governor happens to be from. It, today, it, it, it felt a lot less partisan. A, a lot of the applause lines were both sides of the aisle applauding. And I was sitting up in the gallery watching it, and it didn't feel like, to me, like a big division down there on the floor of the house where the speech was made, but we all know there is a big division. There is a big distance between the governor and the legislature, and there's distance between the house and the Senate, and there's distance between members. It's gonna be a very tough session. To I, I, think, I think, interestingly, I think it's because it's, it was more divided. And, and let me explain. Normally, there's just one division between the D's and R's down there, but right now there are so many divisions. I mean, there's four caucuses in the Senate, maybe five. There's three or four caucuses in the house. And because it is so divided, people don't really know who's on their side. And so I think it was more like the British Parliament today where you kind of had, you know, <laughs> these a few consensus groups clapping on this and a few others clapping on that. That's you a know? good analogy. I agree with that. That's what more, it felt like. A little more of the British Parliament would be great. I'm yeah, looking right. forward to that. More yelling um, at each other. I want to get to that relationship aspect in a second here. But you were there. Uh, was there a gasp? Could you hear a pin drop when all of a sudden uh, CPS, as of this morning, is abolished? It, you, yes. The, uh, the whole room said, there it is. That's the headline. That's the news. That's what we've been waiting for. I, I think the governor uh, understood. She had to come out and do something bold on that issue, and she did. And the way it was written, the way she said it by executive order, we've abolished. It felt like boom, and it had the impact that she wanted. Uh, I, there was an immediate now what, and, and she backfilled some of that. Mm -hmm. The legislature is going to have to act on it, and, and that's still yet going to be an issue that has some difficulties just because. This was something that I think was a legitimate surprise to a lot of folks, maybe up to and including Charles Flanagan, who's yeah. going to head up this new uh, cabinet level position, I suppose, right. that reports directly to the governor. Well, you know, it was like last year, there was that last minute insert. We got advanced copies of the speech last year and they at the last minute inserted Medicaid expansion. And that's what they did this year with this piece. It, it was really unknown up until that moment. And I was sitting behind the scenes. I don't, I don't like to be out there in the hoopla. I was sitting behind the scenes watching with some staff members at the Capitol and, and certainly everybody was surprised. There was a, there was a verbal gasp there because you could do it because we were kind of sitting behind the scenes. And, and it is kind of the what now and, and certainly the devil's in the details. The, point, the thing that I found most interesting and, the, and what was less surprising about it to me and I think the motivation behind it and part of the reason it was done so last minute is this is actually something that a few out there have been calling for just over the last week. Um, Fred Duval, the Democratic candidate for governor for this upcoming election, three days ago did an extensive blog post that's been you know, pretty widely publicized 
exactly about this issue, about making CPS a cabinet level agency. What he did though differently from the governor is in a few paragraphs went into some pretty good detail as to what that looks like. And I thought about this speech that those details were really missing and I think she could have added in a little bit more context. I mean, three or four sentences could have covered the kinds of things that Fred talked about in his, but really this is exactly the same thing that Fred was calling for three days ago. The, what are we seeing? Are we seeing a cabinet position that deals only with child services, family service? And I, I, I thought there was supposed to be another standalone child welfare. Are they separate and apart? What, what, what happened? I think it's unwritten. Uh, it's unifying <laughs> as an issue for both sides. It's in the, both parties' interests. It's in all leadership interests to do something about CPS. And I think there'll be a lot of unity around it. Some of those details, there'll be some brass knuckle fighting behind the scenes about how it should shape up. But for the most part, I think the average Arizona at the end of the session is going to see clearly that that issue has been grabbed and dealt with. I thought the governor was very clear about it. You know, no more. We're not going to do this anymore. Can it be grabbed and dealt with? Uh, can we afford to grab and deal with this? Well, there's constitutional questions about how to grab and deal with it. I mean, can, does the governor really have the authority to take um, an, an agency that's already been appropriated through DES? We're in the middle of a fiscal year. And can she, with today's executive order, unilaterally make it its own, its own agency? And I think she acknowledges that she can't do that herself in the next couple paragraphs where she says, I need the legislature to step up and give me you know, the legislative authority to create an agency. So the devil's going to be in the details, but more importantly, it's going to go right into the sausage making process as well because the legislature is going to have to have its say. Has anyone seen DES Director Clarence Carter lately? <laughs> Uh, no, they haven't. I think he's probably uh, got his head down and is waiting for this to, to now come out of his hands. He's still going to remain, by my understanding, the, the head of the Department of Economic Security and, and where CPS has been housed. And so he's going to be continuing on in that respect. It's, it's the end of the governor's term. He has been a, a loyalist and up until this point has done a pretty good job, everybody believes, and so I think he may survive it because they're moving it. Let's get to education, not mentioned really until quite late in the speech. Yeah. A little bit of surprise? Well, I mean, for me, it, you know, and education being the most important thing to me, I, I'm certainly looking for uh, the governor to, to lay out an agenda for this coming year. And it was late, it was six sentences about K-12 education and a little bit about higher education. and. You know, it was kind of something we've been hearing about for a while. I mean, we've been hearing for a while that she wanted to do something with performance pay. Uh, you know, I'm happy to hear that she's moved off of the whole school letter grade uh, or, or even uh, grouping entire classes together and instead moving to individual student performance. And what I've heard behind the scenes, it's going to be based on student growth. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're going to use a metric for something like performance pay, I think we'd rather see something like individual student growth. So, you know, obviously there again, the devil's going to be in the details because the legislature is going to have to hash that and out as the well. The education thing came late in the, in the speech. I wouldn't read too much into that, but I would say that as a legacy speech, as, as a legacy for a governor who took over some difficult times, she touched on some important things to her that we should take note of. This idea of getting at behavioral health and the CPS matter. This is a Republican governor who has a big heart and wants to do right by the more vulnerable citizens. It's been her hallmark since she served in the legislature. And I thought the, the big fat part of her speech was a lot on that, including the human trafficking uh, mm -hmm. issue, which surprised me that it was in the speech. There it was, and it falls in the same line, that she wants to do something for people that, that are, are vulnerable, and that's going to be a legacy issue for her. Uh, but education is such a big issue, and it's always mentioned, it's always referred to. At the yeah. Chamber of Commerce luncheon, it was, it was a major issue, and she talked about it, I think, more there than she did uh, during the speech here. Um, th th this idea of, of the more uh, uh, growth a student shows, the more money a district gets. The student, I think she called it uh, student success funding is her idea. Mm -hmm. Hasn't, hasn't that idea been thrown around yeah, before? Yeah, I, I think every single idea has been thrown around before. <laughs> I, 25 years ago, I was sworn in, and Jan Brewer was in the legislature. I was a freshman, and education was the number one issue. It remains the number one issue. It will always be the number one issue. And, and so trying something different because times change, politics change, constituencies ebb and flow, and people are ready for something different, and could, she wants to offer it. Could this be a big surprise once she releases her budget later this week? I think it could. That's going to be the, the second shoe. I mean, the, the policy speech, the state of the state speech is one thing, 
but the budget is where the rubber meets the road. That's where the real priorities are laid out. Secondary, post-secondary education, the idea that let's get a, a four-year student's term, let's make the, the, the tuition stable uh, so that we don't have these tuition hikes, which you kind of mentioned that parents are frustrated with. Talk about that, because I know the Board of Regents yeah. has some big ideas as far as uh, university funding is concerned. Didn't hear much response today. Well, for, first, I, I actually like the fact that she used the phrase or used the word in her speech, post-secondary education, instead of college or university, because uh, you mentioned before that I work at EVIT, and of course, post-secondary means something different uh, today and in this economy and in terms of the innovations that we need. So I'm glad that she talked about post-secondary a little bit more generally, but then she did get to the tuition point, which is specifically about you know our four, four major universities or three major universities. And uh, what she what was interesting about that was she's taking the role of the Board of Regents, which is an entity appointed by governors, and kind of saying we should take some responsibility out of their hands and, and we should say we're going to have a more constant, uh, a predictable tuition for our students who are coming in. And I like that idea. I want our students who are coming into our universities to know what it is they're going to be paying, not just their freshman year, but their senior year. The problem is that universities have two major funding sources. They have tuition and then they have the state contribution. And what has been extremely volatile over the last six or seven years has been that state level contribution. And so giving them predictability on tuition, but then the Board of Regents has no say in what the state gives, that will cause some pro funding problems down the road. And I think that she needs to tell the legislature the same thing she's telling ABOR and tell them to be more predictable about the way they fund higher education. Well, was that, was that a little bit of a hit against uh, the Board of Regents there or just an idea for the Board of Regents to look at no, along I, with other plans? There's always a natural tension between the governor and the Board of Regents. I mean, it, it's those are important people doing important work and they don't always see eye to eye. I think it was a message to the Board of Regents though. And her former chief of staff yes. is a very well-respected person, Eileen Klein, who now leads up the Board of Regents. She was sitting in the room. I'm sure the message was received. But this is why we have a legislature and a governor. It's why we have an executive branch and a legislative branch. It's going to be a lot of in the details. Yeah, there's no mention of financial aid either as far as a post-secondary education. So we'll see again what, if that happens uh, as far as the budget is concerned. Uh, were you surprised that she called for a stable funding source for TGen? I, I was pleasantly surprised, uh, and I like how she wrapped it with the uh, the drug analogy that was born there, the idea that the, that created in Arizona and the lives it's saving and that sort of thing, and it, that's something that we've wanted for some time, but it, haven't found the political will to to get up and do. So I was pleasantly surprised she decided to touch it, and uh, she legitimized the issue by showing the good things that are coming out of it. Uh, she touched it, but will the legislature grab it? Well, it's interesting. Of course, you have you have uh, disparate factions even among the majority at the legislature in terms of the picking winners and losers right. argument as to whether or not the state should be providing incentives incentives for certain companies or certain kinds of companies. I think where a lot of them will come down on the same page is job creation. Is this incentive actually going to create jobs? Because that that to me is the biggest question. I think it's on the minds of many legislators. You know, she talks about job growth that we've seen in the last year, and I think the only way that continues is if we continue to provide incentives, not just to industries we like or industries we want Arizona to have, but industries that are going to create jobs in the state. And those industries are also keeping a keen eye on education to see if they're going to have a stable workforce going forward. So that's going to be our two-pronged solution to attracting those industries. That's why I kind of concentrate a little bit more on education, because it seems like the business community is starting to say, all right, we've gotten a lot of tax breaks, a lot of help as far as attracting and retaining. Um, we got to do something about education. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I think it's, it's a unifying force, and there's some shift in that issue. Uh, some of the natural dynamics are changing in it. And I saw a lot of people applauding on the floor uh, from, from the various factions that David's talking about. People you might be a little surprised at applauding? You know, it's just surprising to ever see a lot of people <laughs> applauding <laughs> in the years of On both sides, right? Yes. But Ted, you know, the business community has been there for a few years. I mean, when I, when I started as minority leader in, in you know, 2010 or 2011, the business community approached all four caucuses and said, you know, our, the top of our legislative agenda this year is education. And so they've been there, and I think the legislature, unfortunately, has not answered the call as much as they should. Let's talk about, again, wrapping up the, the governor's uh, term, if this is her final hurrah here. Um, no doubt Arizona is back on track. That's a quote. Arizona prosperity has been secured for generations to come. Arizona's fiscal house is in order. And when referring to Washington's fiscal problems, we can't fish, fix Washington, but we can show them how it's done. A lot of what happened in Arizona was at least 
helped by that one cent sales tax. It helped an awful lot. That's gone. Uh, tax uh, relief is coming soon. As far as revenue is concerned, some are concerned. I mean, are we just whistling past the graveyard here? What's going on? No, no, I, I think you, uh, if anyone feels like we are, they've lost some perspective of how truly bad things were when she took over. Remember, they, the, the legislature uh, had a $3 billion one year difficulty. And yet did not want to cut the government down that much because it wouldn't be a good thing, healthy thing for the economy. So sold the state capitol building and raised taxes by a billion dollars, or at least the voters did once it was approved on the ballot. So she's got a lot to brag about. And I, I, the majority party that made that happen has an awful lot to brag about. Will governance ever be smooth? I mean, is, is, are we going to have some permanent funding that makes everything uh, rainbows and unicorns? No, of course not. It's always a difficult governance. But in comparison to where we were when she took over, things are great, and they're not great at the federal level. The idea that Arizona was in such a bad shape, and, and Arizona comeback leadership, Democratic leadership kind of saying that, you know, come back, talk to people in Yuma, all those sorts of things. The fact is, the state is better off than it was. Right, and we're, and we're getting there, and, and I think, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know that you can have it both ways. I mean, one, in one breath, she, you know, she talks about how great Arizona's doing, and then in another breath, you know, criticizes the federal government. But if you look at the trends in Arizona, certainly it's been more pronounced here, the volatility of, the, of this recession we just went through. But nationally, you, you saw uh, a recession, and then you're seeing great improvements. I mean, look at the stock market uh, just last week. Um, and so, you know, there, there's been some positivity nationally in, in, in the economy. And so that's, that certainly has helped the state. But then she picks this straw man bad guy of the federal government and says the federal government should act more like Arizona. And, you know, I, I think if you look at our legislature and how divided and divisive it is, I think politics in this state, unfortunately, has hurt our economy more in recent years than it's helped it. Is that a valid statement? Uh, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> he misses the central point, I think, that she's trying to make, that the federal government, fiscally speaking, the government, not the national economy, but the federal government is totally, hopelessly out of control and lost and borrowing a trillion dollars a year just to make ends meet. If Arizona behaved in a certain manner, a similar manner, we would all be in a different spot. I think her message to the federal government to be fiscally prudent is a valid message and one which she can stand behind because Arizona was fiscally prudent, federal government's not. Regardless of how you got there, you got there. Yeah, exactly. That, there's a lot of criticism by Democrats, and I thought Chad Campbell was really tough on the governor and his comments after, and, and uh, unrighteously so. I, I don't think he should have been that tough on her because it was a force majeure. It was bigger than all of us when that difficulty hit, and I think uh, she got us there. You think Campbell went over the top? You know, there's a lot of frustration at the legislature, and you know, I'm a, I'm a year out at this point, but I, I still remember some pretty tough days with the politics that, that go on down there. And I, and I think some of it is that level of frustration. But another part is, especially in Democratic districts, we hear from our constituencies that they're not seeing the kind of improvement that they want to see. You know, some of the, uh, you know, richer areas in the state are seeing great improvement. But, you know, places like Chad mentioned, like Yuma, like South Phoenix, you know, a lot of parts of the state are, are kind of lagging behind in that economic improvement. And we want to we want to lift all boats. We want to make sure that everybody uh, has a chance to be prosperous in this economy. Before we go, we touched on this earlier, but I want to get back to this. The governor's relationship with the legislature, the relationship with leadership. Um, always something there. There's always a gap there. Uh, yeah. How big is that chasm? Yeah, it's, it's a natural tension that's set up in the Constitution to be that way. However, now it's bigger than the Grand Canyon. And that's too bad because we, we've got to have personalities getting along together. There has to be a level of trust to actually get bills done, budget signed, that sort of thing. And the fracture that was in the last session, which now feels so long ago, is still fresh in the minds of many legislators. You need a Venn diagram to do it right, but the distance between the governor and the legislature is large, between the houses is large, it's big. Did it narrow at all in the last few months? Uh, I don't believe it did. It's my assessment as an outsider looking in. I think um, it, it is hardened. There are scar, there is scar tissue there. Interesting. There is uh, the campaigns that are, are to come. And, and there is the realization that they've got to do a budget again. And no one today 
perhaps except the governor herself who really holds the cards on this, knows if we're going to do a coalition budget again mm -hmm. or a re Republican budget again. And that question may decide how long the session goes. Right. And, and we asking about the governor's relationship with the legislature, what is legislative leadership's relationship with their caucuses? We had all sorts of drama going on here. Well, I, I was going to say the division now really extends well beyond the branches of government. I mean, it's, it, it has gotten down to the individual rank and file level. And, and I think for a few years, especially in, in my last term there, when you had super majorities uh, in the Republican Party in both chambers, there were a lot of divisions within the Republican caucuses, and unfortunately, we've caught that, that uh, infection from you. When you say we, who do you that, mean? I mean, Democrats <laughs> have caught that infection from you because there's been a little bit of division among Democrats. But I think, uh, I think Democrats will join in solidarity this session, and I think we'll come together with uh, the governor and, and Republicans to do a coalition budget, and I think that's the only way it's, it's going to happen. What about the Republican caucus? Well, well, the, the Republican caucus is is multitude of warring factions and tribes and very hard to diagnose. But the, it is believed by Capitol Watchers, including myself, that the price of poker is higher this year. In other words, when the coalition was done last year, Democrats got the pleasure, the first time in a long time, of splitting the Republicans. And their price was this do the Medicaid expansion deal. And now that that price has got right. to be higher. If you're a Democratic leadership, you're not just going to throw in with a Republican governor on a budget. You're going to demand some Democratic-oriented reforms and laws and money. Will that hold? Uh, will Jan Brewer go along with that, or will she go with any Biggs and any Tobin and do a Republican budget? And will that hold? Will the Democrats hold? I think so, and, and, I, and I frankly, I think a lot of the priorities that she outlined in the state of the state, and, and frankly, I, I thought this was true just about every year that she's given a state of the state, a lot of the priorities she mentioned are in line with democratic values and, and what I think Democrats and the legislatures are going for. And I, I do think that they will hold together, and I think that they'll be open to negotiations, and hopefully they will be invited to the table for this coalition. We've got about 30 seconds left. It's an election year. We're going to see shenanigans, anything crazy going on because it's an election year, whether it's cutting things short or throwing up referrals that make absolutely no sense yeah, whatsoever? of course we are, and, and I resent the judgmental tone in which you <laughs> ask that question. <laughs> this, this is politics. This is self-government, and, and while I don't defend every jot and tittle of it, it's just the nature of human beings in election years to game each other and to set up a better outcome for themselves. All right, and we'll look up jot and tittle after the program. Good to have you both here. Thanks for joining us. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, Senate President Andy Biggs and House Speaker Andy Tobin join us to respond to the governor's speech and to offer their agenda for the legislative session. That's Tuesday evening on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.